my name is Brian Pete. I'm with the Montpelier Police Department. I'm the Chief of Police. Uh, with me is uh, Corporal Mike Philbrick, who is our um, uh, Community Resource Officer and and uh, one of the, and, and our Public Information Officer as well. So Corporal Philbrick will uh, pretty much be leading this discussion. Uh, and so, uh, but before I turn it over, I want to thank folks for taking the time out to, um, to attend. And, uh, and I know that this was a very um, stressful and anxious situation that happened. And, and, uh, and, and, and folks are rightfully concerned. So our, our whole hope is to make sure that we're um, trans as transparent as we can always be accountable to you um, and that we're able to provide you with the information that you need um, so we want to want to provide uh, again uh, now that the case is 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 at a point that we can make sure we put information out there. We want to make sure we do that. So um, let's see. Sorry about that. So um, so uh, with that being said, uh, sir, uh, Mike, if you want to take it over. Thanks, Chief. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're really happy to be able to have these types of events. Um, a part of my role is community outreach and it's something that we've always um, stressed with uh, Montpelier PD as being a community oriented police department. Um, communication uh, and information are two of the most important aspects of our profession. Um, our ability to communicate with each other, with folks who are in crisis, with other agencies, um, and especially with the public um, that we serve is um, you know, just so important. Um, you know, some, some things that we do are, are, are inevitably going to be uh, confidential, but you know, our goal uh, as we move forward, and it's something that has um, I think always been part of our culture and something, something we've been moving more towards with our uh, embracing of social media and other things, other means of communicating with the community um, is gonna be our, our emphasis. So we're glad you're here to join us. We're glad that we can share this information with you. We're glad that we can um, hopefully Help you understand our role and how we address this uh, concerning incident um, and how we would respond um, in the future if something were to happen. Um, so Chief, if you want to advance the slide, we'll go over the um, framework of this um, talk tonight um, and then we'll go through the timeline of um, our investigation and response to uh, this potential threat incident. So we'll cover what happened. Um, we're gonna go into depth into how we uh, responded to this and why we did. Um, uh, Chief Pete's gonna go into the state and federal laws that are applicable. You know, There's a lot of concern about why arrests weren't made and we're hoping we'll be able to address a lot of your, that concern, a lot of your other, other concerns tonight. Um, and then uh, finally, we'll go over our relationship with uh, our school system and how we prepare to respond um, to any a threat to the safety of our, our schools and, and the, the children that they serve. Um, so she, why don't we move on to the uh, timeline. So this, this happened initially over the course of just a few hours on the 17th, um, around 2.45 in the afternoon, uh, we were informed by Montpelier High School staff of this um, report to them by um, you know, the, the really, you know, really courageous folks who came forward, uh, both students and staff. Um, it's not an easy thing to put yourself uh, in a situation, you know, around this type of, um, you know, potential act. Um, that's, it's a scary thing to be involved in. Uh, but, you know, these folks knew it was the right things to do. They knew that we needed to share this information. They knew that what was said, um, while not maybe a direct, a direct threat at the time, was still concerning enough um, that they needed to bring it forward to uh, school staff. And the school staff know, uh, because we work closely with them and have a great, uh, a great, great lines of communication open, um, that they were able to bring that immediately to our on-duty staff. Um, and Chief, if you want to move that next box up. Um, so they, they provide us with the background on this, uh, what their concerns were. Um, you know, we were able to identify the, the folks who had come forward and um, balance their desire for anonymity and their concerns for their own safety uh, with our, the necessary response that we had to make to um, 
uh, to this situation. So we met with those third parties, you know, we were able to interview them, get, get the details we needed, um, and then achieve the advance forward again. Um, you know, we review and look through and assess all of the information that's provided to us. Um, you know, is this just hearsay or is this just rumor or is this an actual, you know, from the, you know, from hearsay and rumor all the way up to an actual threat. Um, and so we make that assessment um, and then we start uh, this process uh, based on what the appropriate response is. And in this situation, uh, I was an 18 year old student who had access to firearms um, and with um, a few years ago, these um, sort of, with, I think they're known as red flag laws were put into effect in Vermont after, a, you know, as a school, a potential school shooting was thwarted, um, the laws were put into effect to help uh, prevent this type of thing from happening again. And we would, you know, we put forward, this is the ideal application of, of these laws. Um, you know, a threat was identified uh, as a, potential, a potentiality, potentiality, sorry. Um, you know, we, we made the assessment, we gathered our information, we coordinated with the Washington County State's Attorney, um, and they help us determine, you know, the, you know, we consult with them constantly about, you know, criminal law and all aspects of the law. Um, they are the attorneys that prosecute um, crimes in, you know, throughout Vermont. Other places it would be called a, a district attorney, but in Vermont's a state's attorney. So we coordinate with them to determine if this, this meets the applicable uh, um, you know, me measures or level to, to uh, apply for something like an extreme risk protection order. Um, and if, it, if someone doesn't know what an extreme risk protection order is, it simply allows law enforcement to seize um, the weapons of someone who ha has the potential to be a threat. So they don't have to have already made threats. They don't have to be an active threat. They have to, you know, this allows us to take care of and address potential threats um, through the limited um, removal of weapons from those that, that, that you know those persons custody in order to address um, essentially to ensure that they are not able to be a threat in the future. So we were able to work with the Washington County State's Attorney. Um, we coordinated with them. We went before a judge, uh, and you know these affid affidavits and paperwork and forms were submitted. We went before a judge. The judge um, you know, reviewed that. Um, application. While that was being reviewed, we contacted area, uh, other area law enforcement agencies. We started talking to the fe various federal agencies that this would apply to. Anything with firearms, we're going to talk to you know, the Bureau of Alcohol, Alcohol Tobacco, and Firearms. Um, you know, we have um, great relationships. Uh, many of our former officers have gone on to be uh, to, to join these agencies, so we have some great relationships with them, and we're able to bring their resources. Um, information expertise to bear on even an incident like this that um, didn't rise to the level of an active threat um, so we can uh, you know assess using using those resources assess sort of what 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 can we bring to bear on this um, this situation to be able to ensure that everyone is safe um, so I mean, notifying everybody make sure everybody's aware of what's going on um, and that and that if they're if anything were to escalate then we have a lot of resources available to us um, around 7 p.m., a few hours later, the order was granted. Our officers immediately went to the residence and acquired um, the weapons and ammunition that belonged to this student. Um, and so within the span of a little over five hours, we were able to mitigate a potential threat to um, the Montpelier High School. Um, and then, you know, we've continued, we continue to update the school. Again, those lines of communication are so important. Um, as part of my role as the community resource officer is to be the school liaison um, and you know making sure that the schools and you know ultimately the families um, and the community generally are, are aware of you know the, you know what we what, what is what has occurred to the best the best that we can share and uh, and hopefully assuage any fears that may have come from um, this type of situation uh, obviously it was a, qu a very quick moving, scenario um, and uh, you know ultimately the uh, the police department and the schools ended up putting out some information sometime later um, it'll let chief pete address any concerns about um, the timing made but i believe we've had you know we've put out a lot of information chief pete has put out a letter the school systems put out a letter explaining a lot of the details into why we had to balance um, anonymity with um, you know, sharing information with, um, you know, making sure that our response is appropriate and we're also not alarming the community unnecessarily. Um, Chief, do you have anything to add to that? 
Uh, no, I, I thank you so very, very much. I can uh, jump into the next one that will, as, as uh, Mike had mentioned, um, to talk about the timing. Um, un unfortunate timing as to everything that, have, that has been going on within our society, within our country since then. Um, so I, so I, I do want to kind of, again, hit on some of the notes that uh, Corporal Philbrook had talked about that the high school acted very quickly when they became aware of this potential threat. The Montpelier High School, um, Montpelier Roxbury Public School System, uh, they are, they're, extraordinarily part, they're extraordinary partners with us. Um, and, and, and we have a very good working relationship and their devotion to the safety and security of students, of our kids who go to that school, um, you know, it, 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 it makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up because they have an extraordinarily amount of concern. So I'm, I'm very, very uh, fortunate uh, for that relationship and for, for folks uh, who have this tremendous responsibility. Um, so in looking at the, uh, the second part is that they also prioritize, again, safety for the staff and for students. Um, we conducted an immediate assessment and that, incest, that assessment includes a lot of fluid things, things that, 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 that could change second by second, hour by hour. Um, and they often include, did the incident occur on campus? No, it did, no, it did not. We didn't have any information that suggested that the subject of this particular um, threat was not on school campus, uh, was not planning to go to school campus, was not you know, uh, everything to that effect. What's the imminency of what's going on? Um, this occurred during uh, hours and where uh, that were leaning towards non-school. Now, keeping in mind that there are activities that, that happen at school. Um, there are folks who are uh, utilizing the tennis courts, utilizing the track, uh, just utilizing the space. So we're, we're balancing and keeping all of that stuff in mind. Um, and then we're looking, and then we also uh, pay special attention to the high school as this is going on. Um, and as we're doing the investigation in the background, as we're conducting the preliminary investigation in the background and doing our best to make sure that everyone is safe. Um, so from there, this was an allegation at this particular point in time. Um, and uh, there was no probable cause for arrest. Uh, the extreme risk protection order um, was filed for, but we go through a judge. It's not something that the police can arbitrar arbitrarily just do. We have to go through the judge. Um, and so we utilized the, that, that tool, which worked. It worked here in this particular incident. And, um, and so at that point, what we're trying to do is take away any known threats or reduce any known threats that we have uh, to keep the community safe. And so we did that. And, and within only a few hours, uh, officers acted quickly, we acted quickly with the FBI, we acted quickly with um, the ATF and with other regional law enforcement agencies, Berlin, uh, Barry City, uh, Northfield, Capitol Police. Um, it, it's just everyone uh, played a part in this. So as I move forward, um, Again, as Corporal Philbrook had mentioned, um, the reporting persons in the family, they're, they're very concerned with anonymity. This is their unintended consequences um, or uh, that, that happen when, when you step up to something, to report something, uh, especially something as high profile and high, high is, is concerning as this. So we want to make sure that we have a precedent that doesn't discourage people in the future from reporting a tip. If the tip doesn't pan out, then thank you. Thank you so much for, you know, you know if it didn't happen, if, if that's what, if you reported something in abundance of caution and, uh, and, and everyone acted on it, great. How do we make sure we have a measured response? How do we make sure that, that folks aren't looked at as like, you know, you're uh, with all the stress and anxiety that comes with reporting that. So we wanna make sure that we have a good precedent that folks know we're gonna do, their, do our best to make sure that they and their family are safe to, to even include um, the person who they're reporting against. I mean, if, if somebody's making a report against uh, someone who they think that may threaten the school, they're obviously gonna be concerned for their own welfare and for the welfare of their family, for their own homes. So we wanna make sure we balance that correctly. Uh, again, this was a multi-law enforcement agency effort. We had no known or credible threats after we made the seizure of the weapons. 
there were still no laws that were violated. Um, the subject's rights, we wanted to make sure we balanced that with the public's immediate need to know. Uh, the Montpelier Police Department, we have an unofficial policy that we do our best for maximum information, minimal delay, uh, as best as we possibly can on staffing and, and all that. So we want to make sure we balance it and are as truly as, 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 as transparent as we say we will be and as, as we said, as, as I've said that we were. Um, so this was an ongoing investigation at this point once the extreme risk protection order was issued. And with that ongoing investigation, again, there are multiple agencies that are helping us with this. We're looking at how do we preserve evidence? How are we not losing anything, any emails, social media accounts, anything else that's going to help us get a profile or an understanding or motive or intent, anything that's going to help us move forward on that one. So we don't want to lose that opportunity. We want to make sure, again, balancing that with maintaining transparency, communication uh, with the community to provide that as soon as possible. Um, uh, and then also that this was an, an in-depth um, investigation. So we're looking at. Chief, all of that included, you know, our, we have an FBI task force officer as part of our department, um, and we had FBI agents out of uh, the regional Albany office coming to conduct interviews with that student, um, and again, bringing those federal resources to bear um, uh, on this potential threat in our, you know, our small community. So we're fortunate to have those, those partnerships. Definitely. And, 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 and again, uh, and, and as you had mentioned, again, as this is a multi-agency effort, there are trade craft things that we're also working to do to determine threat level to uh, to see if this is something legitimate. But I, but above and beyond, we need to make sure while this is a very very disturbing threat and something that we take extremely serious, we also need to make sure that we we are impartial. That any emotions or fear or anxiety that we have or concern that we have. We do our best to stay professional, to stay impartial. Um, if this person intends to do it, we're going to get them. If they didn't intend to do it, we're going to make sure we clear their name. Um, so, and I'm not saying that happened in this particular situation either or. I'm just saying that's where we have to make sure we maintain our impartiality. So state laws, I'll, I'll go into first. Um, the uh, so statute of 4053 talks about the uh, petition for an extreme risk order of protection. In this case, Sergeant Kevin Moulton uh, was the lead here. And my hats off, my gratitude to him for pulling together a lot of people and in a lot amount of time with minimal staffing um, and a lot of moving parts. His concern is uh, for the safety of our community is strong and, and no one uh, we want to make sure that you have no cause to, to believe or to feel that the Montpelier Police Department um, will never um, will never not act uh, for the protection of our community. So with that protection, uh, it gives up at the top um, about the state's attorney may file that petition to, re uh, to request that the court issue that extreme risk protection order. Corporal Philbrick went over that, I think, pretty well, but it's here for folks to read. Um, and then at the bottom right hand corner of the slide, I will put these slides out on our website um, so folks will be able to have access to them. We are also recording this event and then we'll put it on YouTube so other family members or community members can see this presentation. But the, um, some of the information or the links to where I got this information are at the bottom. And looking at 1703 domestic terrorism, this means to engage or taking a substantial step to commit a violation of the criminal laws of the state with the intent to cause death or serious bodily harm to multiple persons or threaten any civilian population with mass destruction or mass killings or kidnapping. Uh, and, and then the look at me with A, B, and, and, and three. I went to the Chicago public school systems, everybody, so I apologize about that one. So it should be C, but or, or I'm sorry, no, three is actually another sub-step, but the substantial step is defined as um, conduct that is strongly co corroborative of the actor's intent to complete the commission of the offense. This is a high bar. This is a high element to meet. How do we prove someone else's intent? And again, this is why we want to make sure that we're not premature in the information that we put out to the public because we want to, to preserve as much evidence as possible. 
So with that, another potential charge that can be, uh, th that we were looking at was criminal threatening. Uh, and this is the amended portion that was recently passed is that a person shall not by words conduct, uh, knowingly conduct a threaten or another person or a group of particular persons. As a result of the threat, place the other person in reasonable apprehension of death. So these are elements that's written by the law, not by the Montpelier Police Department, but that's, that's enshrined in the law. These are elements that we have to meet to, to get to a point of whether we can or cannot arrest somebody, put someone in custody, lodge someone. Um, and, and so this is what we were balancing with and what we were trying to do. Something I, I would like to note to, uh, to folks on this call is that the, the state has no juvenile detection or detention facility. If there's lodging that's required or necessary uh, in, in a case where there is a juvenile subject, there is that possibility that that person may be remanded to DCF for custody uh, because we have no lodging facilities. Um, there are out-of-state options for lodging juveniles in which that the state will have to work with uh, like New Hampshire or New York or somewhere, somewhere else to see if we can have a juvenile subject who poses an imminent danger or a specific danger um, in these particular cases. Let me make sure. So, and looking at the federal law, so USC uh, statute uh, 2335, um, looking at domestic terrorism, this means activities that are going to involve uh, dangerous acts to human life that are in violation. They are, are meant to intimidate or coerce civilian population to influence policy or government or to affect the conduct of a government through mass, mass assassination and kidnapping. Um, so again, as we're looking at state statutes, our federal partners are looking at federal statutes. Domestic terrorism there, how do we also look at the eminence? How do we look at um, with the severity of everything? Um, so just keeping that in mind that we're trying to also meet these bars. Uh, and with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to uh, Corporal Filbert. So in, in conclusion, we want to convey to you, the, you know, the means, the effort that we put into ensuring the safety of our I think he, I think he froze. I'll give it another second to see if he comes out from the freeze. Oh, his just sent me a text, his laptop died. So he'll, he'll be jumping back on here momentarily. Um, so I'll just uh, step in for there. So we wanna make sure that everyone knows we will always, always be here for, for the community and we will always give it our best. Um, and uh, we, we maintain our communication with the Montpelier High School. Again, a very strong, robust relationship that we have with uh, Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools that we also pay special attention to, that we also pay special attention to school locations uh, during high peak times as call volume and staffing permits us to, that we have very, very strong partnerships with regional state and federal agencies to the point that we have officers, even in limited manning, we, we recognize the importance of this. And we have three officers who are part of task force teams throughout the state. Um, that there's Alice training that we have, uh, that uh, Corporal Philbrick, when he comes back in, he'll talk about the training he's received from the FBI, uh, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, uh, one of our detective corporals, Diane Matthews, who is also trained in Alice, and that's alert, lockdown, inform, counter evade, and to provide that Alice training, not only to MRPS, but to um, houses of worship, other, unfortunately, in this day and age, uh, political party headquarters, Republican, Democrat, independent, progressive. Everybody's being targeted nowadays. And it's, it's, a, it's a sad sight to see, but we want to make sure that we have the means to protect and safeguard against any emerging threat that we may face as a community. Uh, I also want to mention that the Montpelier Fire Department is also trained to come into situations, to come into warm uh, events where if there is an incident that happens, that there's a, an, an active uh, shooter situation, that they're coming through with um, and able to treat people who may be injured um, on scene uh, as the as the 
whatever, wherever the scene is, but they're coming in there with us to provide emergency medical uh, care for folks who may be in injured in an active response. Um, and then there's uh, several folks have, have asked me what happens, okay, this is what happened in this particular situation. Um, what, what will the department do if there's an active event? And the answer to that one is we mobilize, we reach out to our partners and we respond quickly. We do not wait for, in, in the old days when these things started becoming more, unfortunately, more routine in our society, it used to be that law enforcement would stand outside and you'd, you'd gather up enough people until you thought that you were safe going inside and then you would make your way in, into, that, into that live situation and do what you could. Um, so uh, Corporal Philbrick's back. Um, so I'll just finish this one thought um, and I'll just say that th those days are gone. Uh, law enforcement enters and we move immediately to, to, to try to identify and neutralize any threat that's going on. And then to, to let folks know how dangerous of a situation this is and, and some of the reasonable, uh, and this, 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 this supports why we know it's important um, because any officer that's going to enter in an, into an active scene has roughly a 70% chance of being shot based on data and past instances. So the officers are going in there knowing um, what we're about to deal with, but that's nothing to the folks who are experiencing it right then and there. So our commitment to making sure that we provide that safety and security to this community is, is, is always going to be above reproach. And with that, um, Mike, if you wanna go ahead and go through this uh, again. Let's see, gotcha. You should be unmuted now. You good? Yeah, my apologies, some technical difficulties there. You haven't been uh, Zooming enough if you haven't uh, had technical difficulties with Zoom. Uh, all right, my apology, I'm sorry. Uh, let me get back into this. Um, so you just wanted to cover and reassure um, how our department um, addresses a lot of these issues and concerns. Um, uh, first and foremost, like I mentioned earlier, communication is, is just paramount. Um, our ability to interact closely with the school, various school administrations, both the uh, superintendent, Libby Bone Steele, and all of her staff, uh, the various principals and administrative staff um, and teachers all the way down through to the crossing guards um, have, has just been a great opportunity of mine. Um, yeah, as Chief introduced me as the community resource officer at the beginning of the school year, and since then I've been able to provide advice and um, spend time in the school zones addressing uh, safety concerns around traffic. I mean, any number of aspects of school safety we've been able to assist with, and that communication has been both ways. You know, we've needed something from the schools. They've been um, incredibly helpful. Um, and so, you know, having that open line of communication, having, you know, the the principal being of the middle school being able to, to text me and say, hey, what do you think about this? Or to be able to come to our on shift staff like Sergeant Moulton that day um, and bring to this concerning situation to, to them and be able to address it immediately. Um, because if we didn't have that communication, then, you know, I think it would be a lot more difficult to be a lot, a lot more of a, a possibility of, of um, worse outcomes uh, in these types of situations. Um, so as she alluded to earlier, our, our school staff is an incredibly professional, incredibly caring, um, and incredibly uh, committed to uh, the safety of their students. Um, you know, as whether it be after an incident like this or, or generally, as I said, I've been, you know, we've, we spend a lot of time um, around the, the school zones. Um, you know, uh, we've had complaints about everything from, you know, kids walking to school and traffic around the, the various schools. Um, to something at, of, of this, you know, this level and caliber. So um, we have been you know, spending regular time uh, around the school campuses um, and the school zones and the areas in between, um, as well as providing special attention um, after this type of incident, you know, having officers stationed uh, around the high school um, and other responses like that, uh, just as we're able to, um, to address it with, with tapping uh, restraints. Um, the partnerships we already touched on, I mean, we have amazing partnerships with our area uh, police departments, with 
a lot of uh, you know supporting agencies and entities, um, everything from Washington County Mental Health, um, you know, all the way up to you know these incredible federal agencies, the FBI and ATF and others who um, are able to bring incredible resources to bear on our little for our little department, our little community, um, in our little state. Um, a big part of response to active events. Um, it doesn't have to be an active shooter. It could be any sort of active safety event um, is training the community, training the, the staff and others at different entities that might be, um, you know, school staff and students that might be the employees of large um, organizations and corporations in town. Uh, you know, everything from the schools to government buildings, the state uses this type of training system um, in, and houses of worship and others. Um, as this has become a more um, prevalent topic, there's been a lot of um, outreach from the community and desire for us to be more involved in helping to train uh, entities to respond. Um, and so part of that is a, a type of training called ALICE training, and you can see the acronym there. It stands for, and it's, it's supposed to be very simple and straightforward. It's, it's a, a program that was developed in, and has been disseminated by the federal government um, and it's alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. So that allows you to, um, to train uh, community members of any organization to respond appropriately to um, any active threat. Um, and that's to you know, alert, let, let everyone know in the community what's uh, going on, with everybody in that facility, everybody in that uh, organization um, lockdown is, you know, com at, at becoming a more common term, but being able to lock facilities down and preparing to do that, um, informing everyone what's going on, informing first responders what's going on, um, preparing to counter, uh, and this is, you know, something that is a challenging conversation to have with a lot of folks, um, and that is, you know, how do you respond to a threat? How do you address somebody who might be trying to harm you? And some, some, for some people that might be, you know, hiding and, and sheltering in place. Others, they may respond um, with their own, you know, attempts to defend themselves. Um, and then at the very, at the very end of there is evacuate. You know, the goal is to get everyone out safely um, as, as best we can and getting, you know, that requires medical attention or other resources um, like fire and EMS and others. Um, that's all part of that training. So, both, you know, that's going to help segue into our own response. Um, and, you know, by having a, a, a community that is trained and these entities and large organizations that are trained to respond, that helps us respond better. Because if everybody knows how to respond, is able to lock themselves down and shelter in place and so on, then we are better able to, um, you know, direct our response to the threat. Um, and so the way that we, would respond to this type of active event. I just want to go over a variety of, of the areas of our preparation. So, you know, I, I just touched on training, Alice training. The biggest part of our response is training for it. Um, all of our officers receive active shooter response training from the academy going forward in their careers. Um, we've trained in very, uh, a variety of our officers have trained in different um, programs. One of the most prevalent is called Alert. It's another uh, federally supported program uh, that's provided free of charge to uh, law enforcement agencies uh, with the goal of having a variety, you know, any area agency um, to be able to have the same type of response training as other area agencies so that we, when we all respond um, and end up at some incident, we're, we're uh, trained in the same manner, the same response. Um, that ALERT uh, program stands for, it's an acronym that stands for Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training. Um, and that's a active shooter response training specifically um, using, using everything from, you know, a single officer up to larger teams of officers. Um, and we, and we certainly have uh, trained in single officer response. Um, the trainings that we've held for our officers and for other area agencies, we we've been able to, through our communication, our relationship with the school, have been able to hold them in school facilities, sometimes during breaks and other um, times when the schools are empty so that officers and area uh, other area agencies and their officers can be familiarized with our schools because they are going to be the ones who are going to be helping us they're the ones who are going to be responding to these uh, significant incidents and we've already seen several examples of this over the last few years of the amazing um, mutual aid response that we uh, will get when there's a critical incident that happens in Montpelier 
Um, that includes the high school, the lower grade campuses. We've even done training at U32 because we we're one of the closest um, uh, agencies to that uh, campus, um, as well as National Life, Houses of Worship, and our, of course, the, the, the large number of government buildings that are in Montpelier. Um, our, we've trained with our fire department um, to establish triage and trauma care within what we call warm zones. So a hot zone would be where there is an active threat. A warm zone would be where the threat has passed and now other, other responders can now come in safely and be able to start triaging and providing trauma care. Um, and allow, that allows for a much quicker life-saving response than if you know, we keep everybody out until, um, until everything is concluded. Um, and that also would speed up evacuation of both on injured and uninjured parties. Um, also generally area first responding agencies, uh, you know, we have a huge number of um, volunteer and professional fire and, and uh, uh, EMS agencies, as well as state hazmat and other responders um, who have hosted mass casualty events uh, in the Montpelier area, which again, allows us to practice these skills, practice these, um, you know, incredibly life-saving skills um, and familiarize all these area agencies that may not work in our area all the time um, as to what they might be addressing when they come to, to Montpelier to help us. Um, we coordinate a lot of this training um, with our area a, law enforcement agencies, like I mentioned earlier, so that um, when somebody comes to help us from Berlin, from Barry, from Northfield, from the state police, um, from federal agencies, from D DMV, I mean, we've We've had incredible response from a variety of agencies and by having them come and train with us ahead of time on all these uh, in all these areas um, in our schools in our businesses in our um, you know in our community it means they're better able to respond appropriately when uh, they come here and it'll be a more efficient and uh, um, and effective response um, you know we learn to work together we our chain our chains of command learn and learn to work together all of our um, Leadership is trained in the incident command system that uh, is um, set up by FEMA. So everybody's trained on how to run these events. Uh, it means that, again, that they will be, we, our response will be much more effective. Um, recent training in the last year even has included um, tactical response to the active shooter, but also other areas that are important um, because when we, while we do need to be able to respond, respond up into um, dealing with a lethal threat, we also need to be able to use less than lethal and de-escalation skills. And so the recent tactical training has included that. Um, and again, that's brought in, we brought in agencies from all over the state and hosted this training here locally um, at, at the high school and in some other uh, facilities in the area. Um, and those, those trainers are, are, are quite impressive. They, they have extensive field and tactical experience at the federal level. Um, through some federal agencies with the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Um, and then uh, recently we, had, we adopted a virtual reality training system, which, you know, maybe it sounds like it might be a game or something fun or what, what have you, but it's an incredibly important tool because um, this system allows officers to practice with, their, with, their, with our skill, with, you know, with their skills and equipment in a variety of scenarios, everything from, you know, a, a mental health crisis to, um, you know, an active shooter incident. Um, but these virtual environments can be custom tailored to represent our high school or the Capitol building or any local building or facility so that anyone could come in regardless of what the availability or what the day or time um, and be able to train regularly um, with these skills and, and tools and environments that we're going to potentially be responding to. Um, and that was a, a grant funded um, piece of equipment that was uh, you know, it's been becoming, slowly becoming part of our, our, our training regimen. It's, it's great to be able to have. Um, so those are some of the ways that we train and prepare for these types of incidents. Our, our officers are, are trained to respond as quickly as possible to an active scene. We're trained to engage any threat, either as solo officers or as multi-officer teams. We're equipped with protective gear and weapons and equipment to address any active threat. Um, our training emphasizes locating and engaging an active threat immediately as statistically active shooters will either surrender or take their own life when confronted by law enforcement. Um, if they're being engaged by, and then are focusing on us as responders, then they will be less able to harm others. Like that is our motivation. That is our goal. That is how we are trained um, to respond to these incidents. Um, and, and, you know, and so, and that kind of, I hope that gives our community some measure as to the level that we've gone over over decades worth of 
of preparing for these types of incidents, um, constantly adjusting, constantly adapting, um, constantly learning from others' successes and others' mistakes. Um, and it's, it is our goal to ensure that our community is safe, that our schools are safe, um, and we are able to respond appropriately and as expected to ideally any incident, but especially these that are most severe. Um, and finally, at the bottom of the site here, we shared it on our Facebook page and it's been shared around quite a bit lately, um, is there is a state, uh, a state website uh, and link and a state uh, number where you can provide tips um, specifically about school, school threats um, or, or, or concerning events um, within school systems in the state, um, but also there is a general tip, tip line and thing for any tips relating to crime. And it is, it is anonymous, it, you know, as it's is often said, you know, we want the information, not your, your identity. Um, so we hope that people will, uh, you know, because of that challenge and the, the difficulty and the stress and anxiety around uh, making reports and putting yourself out there for that, we're hoping that by sharing this type of, you know, tip line or this type of means to anonymously provide information that the information will still be shared and we'll still be able to act on it and prevent and address threats, but um, that people will feel, you know, more comfortable sharing it if they're not willing to come forward directly. Um, so that concludes our section on our preparations. Um, Chief, do you have anything to add? Sorry, my cat's, my cat's being a little loud. No, no, sir. Um, I, I really appreciate it. You, um, and thank you very much for, for that, um, for, for putting it together as I'm trying not to get emotional with it and you're handling it very, uh, very more methodically. So thank you all very, thank you very much, sir. Um, uh, so, so with that, I'd like to um, to open it up. We, we've I've been uh, Facebook or I'm sorry, Zoom bombed before. So um, we we've got the whole mute function on, and we're just gonna open it up to questions. I'll, I'll call it out. I see uh, Dave, so I'll ask you to unmute and please uh, ask any questions that you may have of us. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for what I think is an exemplary job that. Uh, MPD did, and probably the, the school system as well, because uh, we're talking about something that didn't happen. But my question is, and I'm not familiar with this, extreme risk protection order. It's a high bar, apparently, and the bar was met. And what can you walk me through what happens in the next six months to mitigate the risk that is allegedly extreme and hopefully uh you know will be reviewed and who does the review and i mean are there different like risk levels it's like well it's okay this subject can get his firearms back because he's a moderate risk or she's a moderate risk uh, probably not and I mean, I just don't have any information about that it seems more of a civil action than a criminal action. Who does the review? Is there psychiatric or counseling that goes to the individual? Do they make an assessment? You get the idea. So I will say regarding any psychiatric evaluations or anything else, any other steps, um, uh, I'm very confident that the uh, that Libby Bonesteel and her team are all over that as it relates to the student that's in question. I can tell you for this particular incident, the, uh, the weapons, in this case, again, uh, six months for seizure, but I can tell you that the weapons are confiscated in ATF custody and they will be destroyed. So I can chime in a little bit. Like, you know, Dave, this uh, this is new to us as well. I mean, we I think we've we've probably only served a handful of these. You know, I can probably count the number we've served, and I'm, I'm not always privy to everything going on, but um, I can recall, you know, at least a handful of having been served. And since this um, law came into effect, so it's a very rare thing for them to, for this to be utilized. And there has to, like you say, there has to be a, a pretty unique high threshold that have been met. Um, and part of that, just like a lot of what we do, it, it goes under judicial review. Um, so basically we had to write up an affidavit and with the assistance of the um, state attorney's office, um, including all of the facts, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of like in a, in a charging affidavit, you include the facts of probable cause. We have to include all the facts of why this, you know, of, of, of the circumstances and why this 
meets that threshold. You know, and often when applying for a warrant or sending a case up, sometimes it, it doesn't meet the, the threshold and it's denied. Um, and so in this case, it was not denied. It went, a judge reviewed the affidavit and then a hearing, just as in many other types of, uh, you know, either civil or legal um, documents or orders, um, like, like with their training order, um, there's a hearing that is set. And that was kind of, I think that was publicized that, it, that there had recently been a hearing, which is, at, which is where that six month time period came from. Um, and so as I understand it, you know, this information is put before a judge, they issue the order, a hearing is set, um, and it's up to the prosecutors, the state's attorney, um, and the individual and any representation to argue whether that um, order should remain in effect or should be released. And so it'll, it'll continue to be reviewed in that respect, um, almost like a court case in front of a judge um, you know, until there essentially until it no longer meets the threshold of, of a threat. Um, and I don't know what that necessarily is going to look like down the road, but they're going to have to prove that they're not, they're not a threat to, you know, before a judge. And Mr. Hoy. Thank, thank you very much, Chief Pete and, uh, and Corporal Philbrick. Let me uh, lower my hand here first. Um, I, the, both of you might recall, uh, I'm not sure, I am a, a reporter with Local 22, Local 44 News up in Colchester. And uh, a gentleman, I, I do have uh, one question for you. That being, uh, Chief, actually about uh, an incident that uh, took place in Montpelier uh, before your time here. It happened not very long after uh, I moved to our region. And uh, not, not the particulars of the incident, but as I recall, it was uh, one involving a, a bank robbery suspect who uh, ended up, yeah, engaging in a, a standoff with uh, both your department and a myriad of other uh, law enforcement agencies. As I recall, not inside or anything, but, uh, but on uh, the grounds of the high school, I believe on the football field, if I'm remembering that correctly. Again, uh, my question is not about the, the particulars of that, but how a, if, might that incident uh, be informing uh, the the training all of you do, and and if not, is it not? I would be interested to know a little bit about that. So uh, I, I totally understand. If, if I make sure I understand the, the 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 question correctly, how did that particular incident influence um, influence us regarding training, our policies, procedures, and and how we act? Uh, it, it, indeed, Chief. Yes. Yes, sir. It, it heavily, heavily, um, and and it also even goes back to to an officer wellness issue as well. Um, but uh, it, it's something that we know Montpelier is not exempt to. And it further drives home the fact that we need to make sure that we're prepared and we owe it to this community and to each other um, to make sure that we have the right training, the right tools, the right equipment to answer any potential threat that our community may face. And so, it, it, and again, that, that is, that, that's very powerful for us. Um, when uh, in that particular incident, the SRO was the one who had set the ball rolling and, and, and limited or contained that particular threat from going on to the school campus. So we want to make sure everything within our power to maintain the safety and security of this community, even if it's just a little bit, but every little bit helps. So, we, so, so again, that's a great um, uh, a, a wake up reminder for us. And uh, uh, Corporal Furbeck, I don't know if you'd like to add anything to that. Well, it's an example of you know, the Alice system working. The school was able to be put on lockdown. The school resource officer was present at the high school and immediately responded to a threat on campus um, and contained a person to the football field instead of having them any number of things. I mean, it's a, a busy thoroughfare of Route 2 going through there, Memorial Drive, I mean, it's the Department of Labor building adjacent. Um, as Chief, you mentioned earlier, the track is being used. The, the, the um, you know the, the bike path goes through there. There are students coming and going in cars. I mean, any number of things could have happened that would have, that could have escalated um, to members of the community um, being injured outside of, of Mr. Giffen. So um, it, while it's a, a tragic outcome, um, and I was personally involved, and I, um, as Chief mentioned, it, it, it takes its toll on me every day, um, but. You know, I, I try to look at it um, you know, in an impartial way and say like, okay, you know, the lock, the, you know, the, this SRO was there, he initiated the lockdown, the kids were safe, the, the threat was contained. 
Um, and you know, all of our, our mutual aid partners came to help us. Um, you know, medical care was immediately available. Um, it was just, you know, it was it was a tragedy, but it was also an example of, of the system that we have in place, the training and such working. Um, you know, and there have been some, you know, like GP alluded to, there have been changes in, in equipment and training and other things. And we just keep trying to do it better, keep trying to think of ways to avoid that type of tragic incident from happening again. Um, but, the, but at the very minimum, it was not, you know, it was, it was not worse than it was. I don't doubt it for a moment, Corporal Philbrick. Thank you. And thank you, Chief. I'll mute myself again. Thank you for your question. Um, anyone else have any, uh, Ron? There should be a little button that goes across. There you go. Yeah, I was wondering <clears throat> what, uh, what is there to prevent this person from getting another set of handguns or whatever at this point? I can talk to that, Chief. Um, so part of this process and interacting with our, our federal partners was ensuring that um, just just as when somebody be, so, so when somebody um, is arrested as a felon or has a restraining order in place or now this type of order order, um, they are they are under federal law considered a prohibited person. They can no longer purchase a firearm, or purchase or possess a firearm. So part of the process is to go and, and you know take custody and seize the firearms that they have. But they also are put into uh, a federal database that, pre that prevents them from being able to purchase a firearm legally from um, you know, a federal firearms dealer, um, or now uh, they're, 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 people are required to get um, background checks uh, when they um, purchase firearms, uh, private sales individually. Um, and so we ensure we contacted, it's called the NICS database, NICS. Um, and of course, the uh, name of the acronym, many acronyms, but the name of the, the meaning of the acronym is escaping me, but it's a national database that all um, firearm sales go through. Um, like I said, when they meet certain criteria. Um, and so we may ensure that he was entered into, into that database um, and will be indefinitely until this order is, is disposed of. Um, you know, obviously people acquire firearms and weapons in other ways, um, you know, things that are stolen or sold on the black market and so on. So there's no perfect method to prevent someone, but you know, at the, at the very minimum, we're very aware of this person. We're very aware of the capabilities. They are being, you know, they're they've been scrutinized. They're being investigated. Um, you know, we're monitoring, you know, the schools and and this person generally um, to make sure that number one, they're not a threat. Number two, they receive support and help to help address whatever was the underlying cause of this. So that's I think you mentioned earlier that the police uh, go into the uh, the school in this case as soon as possible. In that case, what happened in Texas recently? There's so much publicity about whether or not the police hesitated or whether they they uh, put too much time between the the time that they were alerted until they entered the school. Do you know anything about that or what happened there? As far as Texas is concerned, I, I don't know. I'm eager to see any after action reports. There are often communication channels and lessons learned uh, in which we can, we can see what happened in those particular cases and learn from them to make sure they don't happen here. I will tell you that with, uh, we just recently had training as Corporal Philbrook alluded to uh, with, with a gentleman who is, um, uh, who is very skilled at this, uh, probably one of the nation's best subject matter experts who came in and provided that training to us. So um, I, I can tell you as far as the Montpelier Police Department is concerned, as far as our regional partners, Washington County law enforcement is concerned, the state police for Mont and our federal partners are concerned, we will not hesitate to go in. We are trained to do that. We will do that. And not only because it's something we're trained, we're trained to do it as safely as possible, but we go in there because we need to protect our kids. Full stop. That's why we go in there. And, and so I apologize. I, I don't necessarily know the, 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 the specific answer to what happened in Texas, but I can tell you what the Montpelier Police Department will do. Thank you. Are there any other questions? And thank you so much for your question. I, I really appreciate it. 
Um, I, I've got the same amount of concern. And I'm, I'm as a parent, I'm looking to find out what happened as well. And uh, and and I definitely acknowledge the anxiety that this particular incident happened at this particular time in our particular community. So I, I apologize for any stress or duress that this may have caused, that this has caused folks. So uh, again, uh, but yes, Cynthia. You have to un unmute Cynthia. Sorry, you're still muted. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for recognizing me and thank you for having this forum. Um, I, I know it's no uh, news to anybody here that um, if someone is potentially dangerous, they often have a mental health issue. And um, I know that it's um, difficult to force someone to get treatment. Uh, there was a very disturbing story on um, uh, public radio this morning about an incident of um, a lot of people being alerted and uh, essentially a woman went and shot her father and uh, she had a known history of having a gun. She had a known history of having a mental illness and um, she still got through the system. And what I heard on the radio today was that one of the problems is that we have a good amount of laws to protect people, but we don't have a good amount of <laughs> um, people in authority that can en enforce these laws. So can we feel comfortable in this community that even though the Montpelier Police Department took all those steps to make sure this uh, current person um, has been put on the registry. Uh, can we feel comfortable knowing that the dealer, the people who sell guns um, and ammunition in our area actually are, um, are, are monitored that they're, they're doing the right thing? Because in this case that I mentioned about uh, hearing about this morning is that um, there are many places that are really good and reliable places to get firearms, but there's many people who ignore it and they they're haven't even um, had any consequences. Um, so can we feel comfortable that um, at least in our area, these people are monitored that are selling guns? I can tell you that uh, our department, um, that the, the officers, the dispatchers, the uh, community service officers that I have here, I, I put my life in their hands. And, and I am confident that everything they do is, is thorough, um, is impartial, and is diligent above all. So, so we, any information that we get that we receive, or I'm sorry, get that we receive, but any information that we get, we, we run it to the ground. And if we have information that suggests that someone is not doing what they're supposed to be doing, um, as far as laws are concerned, and with selling ammunition or selling weapons, we take that extraordinarily seriously. And again, we have three officers who are part of a federal task force. I can also tell you that the, um, our federal partners in Vermont are extraordinarily serious about this as well. So we're ready to move and we're proactive in trying to find people who may not, or who may be putting our community at risk by not adhering to the laws that are designed to keep us all safe. But th there's another aspect of it too. And, and again, which is why I'd like to applaud the folks who came forward on this one is that um, we also need the eyes and the ears of the public. And we need folks to, to come forward and we want to make sure again that we establish that precedent that people can feel safe in anonymity when they make these reports, when they provide these concerns, because we can't do it or see it all without our community. And, and again, that leads to a whole bunch of other different things, but that is why we um, are, are doggedly trying to protect our reputation within this department as a professional organization that folks feel that they can always trust us and that we're always there for them 
Um, and, and that's how we do our job. So there's a lot that adds on to that, but I can tell you, um, I have the utmost confidence in our officers. And so our so uh, Chief Pete, um, you may have answered this and it just went by me, but is there a system in place that checks people who sell firearms and ammunition that they actually are doing their due diligence and checking the registry? The answer is yes. There's a it's, so that's a that's a federal it's a federal firearms license that happens. So it's it's their federal agencies that look into that, and I know that they do audit. They do check all these different things. And so as folks are um, purchasing weapons, background checks, everything else to that effect, um, there is a mechanism in place. Whether it, it's it's not a municipal mechanism, it's a federal mechanism, and our partners are working on our partners continue to monitor and watch that. Good. And the, the other part of my question, I'm sorry, I'm taking a lot of time, but as oh, no. a former uh, school nurse, I know how hard it is to get um, mental health um, help for um, anybody at any age, but sometimes particularly youth. And um, I, I don't know if you, if this is appropriate question, but is the police department able to follow up if, if this person involved in the, in the current incident has mental health problems? Is there any way to follow up that they're getting the, the best treatment they can? So we do have a social worker who, uh, and we work extraordinarily close with Washington County Mental Health Services. And so we do those referrals and put that information out there to do those follow-ups. Um, so yes, there is a mechanism in place, but there are also other mechanisms that we, we, uh, we move forward in, in, in trying to, trying to uh, just cover as many aspects as we possibly can. So can you, can you get around HEPA? No. <laughs> Right. So the police department does not really, even with the order that you got from the judge, have the right to follow up uh, and see if if this person indeed needed um, mental health um, therapy. There is no, no way. There, there is no way for us to do that because that's that's something that 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 is not um, a, a part of part of our area, um, but, but I'm, I'm confident and, and, uh, and Libby and, and the folks at the high school as to all of the follow-ups that they're doing for mental health wellness and checks as to whether that person is coming back on campus or not. Uh, those types of fitness assessments, um, I know that that's in another area. And again, uh, we are very strong partners with them. We don't have direct access to staff, um, uh, but we are very strong partners. And, and if there's anything that they have a concern of, we would, they, I'm pretty sure they would let us know and we would continue moving forward with any investigations. I don't mean any disrespect to anybody involved, but don't be too confident. Um, as Michael probably, um, Captain Michael probably knows, there's an awful lot that goes on in schools and there are not enough staff. Um, and I, I, I I don't think we can assume because the schools only have so much power as well, probably even less. Um, so yeah, it, it, I guess I'm just saying, please just anything that is within the scope of the law, please keep an eye on what's happening and don't be comfortable that it's going according to plan. Now, um, I, I'll say my, my plan is I don't know everything that's going to go on. And, and th that that I do know, um, I, I, we, we, we put everything uh, to bear that we, can, that we can meet those thresholds and those, those challenges that we are aware about. So, so at right now, the, the, in dealing with the school, we're, we're limited uh, in that. So we need to make sure that, that we're strong in our, in our conversations and our communication. So what, what my confidence is, 
My confidence is that the programs that we have put in place are the strongest they can possibly be, mm -hmm. but any blind spots or challenges that we're working to overcome, those are things that we're obviously working to overcome and it's, it takes partnerships and, and, and other things to, to shore it up as best as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know Michael, um, you are a key, key person in all three of the schools and I am so glad to see that your position has been reinstated. And I don't know how it happened, but <laughs> I, um, I know sorry. that you make a huge difference. I'm sorry, Cynthia, if I can make a clarification. Uh, uh, Corporal Forbeck is actually a community resource officer. Uh, we no longer have a school resource officer. So there are no police officers in the schools. Okay, so, so it hasn't been reinstated and I'm hoping that there's some vehicle where it can be because I know that makes a difference. And I do know that kids at the high school think that they have a resource officer. So I don't know where that came from, but um, yeah. Thank you, Cynthia. That was a great, it's a great uh, testimony. I appreciate it. Anyway, thank you. I've taken enough of your time. Thank you, um, Ron. Thank you, Cynthia, for, for, for very good questions and, and very engaging. Yeah, I was just wondering, some time ago I read that you have a staff shortage. Has that improved? Do you have enough staff now? Uh, no, it has not improved, and uh, regrettably, we do not have enough staff. How many do you need, or would you estimate you need? How many would I estimate that I need for? Yeah, uh, new, new, new employees, yeah. Um, I, I would... Um, I would I would say as, as far as our standard workload and complement, um, we currently are authorized 17 sworn officers, but um, I, I would be be comfortable with um, anywhere between 19 to 21 officers that would allow us to do more um, to do more to be more proactive, engaged, so that 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 we minimize the opportunities of things like this happening within our community. So for example, Corporal Phil, Philbrick has a huge role to play, um, not only in just reaching out to partner organizations, but also to, um, to businesses, to houses of worship, to working on uh, policies, procedures, and rules. There's a lot that goes on into what Corporal Philbrick does, but he can't do it because he's covering a shift and then he's working overtime. So for example, the, um, another example of, of with our current overtime budget, the Montpelier Police Department's budget $123,000. We're over hundred or $200,000 in our overtime budget because we have to have officers in overtime to fill positions for normal patrol duties. So, um, so uh, just to put that information that's out there um, that we, um, I would prefer to, to, to move up a little bit so we can be more proactive in reaching out to the community. But, but I was wondering not how many um, you would have ideally, how many more do you need to satisfy your, yeah. So yeah, we're currently staffed at 14 right now. And again, we're authorized. And, and but that, that 14 level includes that um, we have uh, again, some folks who are in training and then that also doesn't account for uh, anytime somebody's on vacation or sometimes uh, sometimes somebody may be injured, uh, things to that effect. So you would hope to get at least three more, more or less, 14 and 317, yeah. Yeah, I, I, me personally, I think that, that that would be a good number for our department, but that's going to be a very, uh, if and when that opportunity comes up to have that discussion, it'll be something I definitely bring up through, through my chain of command, through the assistant city manager, the city manager, and the city council. And, and if it ever got to that point, definitely have a community discussion because it's a significant thing to do. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, thank you for, for your question. Are, are there any other questions or, or, or anything else that uh, Corporal Philbrick and I can answer? Okay, I'm, I'm not seeing anything. So I would like to, again, thank you all for your, for your time, um, uh, for, for, your, for your questions, for your attention. 
and, and for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, again, uh, this was a very stressful situation for everybody, for all those involved. Um, but I, I especially want to commend the Montpelier Roxbury Public School District um, for uh, their diligence and for their help and for their concern and for their partnership. And um, uh, Mike, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to say before we uh, close out. Yes, thank you for this opportunity, Chief Pete. Thank you for our, the community members who've joined us here. Um, I've say in, in doing the outreach work that I've done, I've never had a bad conversation with someone. You know, we can all under, try to understand each other's points of views. We can exchange ideas and information um, and have empathy and, 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 and share. I mean, it's so important. So I hope there'll be more of this. Um, and I'll apologize for the technical difficulties and my various animals. Um, they, they wanted to chime in as well, um, but that's- But they made a great of, contribution. You shouldn't apologize for them. It's just part of being, <laughs> Part of the community and uh, maybe an animal lover. It humanizes things. It humanizes the whole issue. Well, I'm glad. I'm, that we, I'm just uh, joking. I'm just being silly. <laughs> no, I appreciate that, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> woof woof. <laughs> well, well, thank you, folks. Again, we we sincerely appreciate your opportunity, your attention, and and the privilege to speak with you. And if there's any questions. Uh, anything else that, that we can ever answer for you, please don't hesitate to reach out to, to Mike or myself uh, via email, via phone call. Um, we're here to help and to serve. So thank you all. Have a great night and be safe. Thank you, sir.